Um, welcome everyone to the IPFS Pinning Summit. Um, super excited to uh, get to talk to you all today and so excited for our amazing speakers and folks who are going to be sharing more about the work they're doing in the IPFS Pinning Summit later today. Um, I'm going to start off, kick things off for you this, well, it's morning here in PSC, um, talking about some of the growth and opportunities and, and kind of new, new things we're seeing in the IPFS ecosystem, and then hopefully also set the stage for a lot of our presenters later. For those of you who are not super familiar with IPFS, IPFS is designed to make the web work peer-to-peer. -peer. So instead of a centralized HTTP model where many devices all push their connections and, and data through a central server, which uh, addresses and hosts all their content. Um, IPFS is designed to directly connect um, nodes with each other so that they can collaborate in a much more flexible, resilient way, so that even when a subset of nodes go offline um, or aren't able to connect to other nodes in the network, they're still able to collaborate and use the tools they rely on. IPFS does this by using content addressing. So instead of addressing content by where it's located in the network or what entity is hosting that data, um, it addresses the content directly by its cryptographic hash. And this allows us to be much more flexible about where we fetch data from, how we move it around the network, how we deduplicate it, how we verify that data is what we expect it to be instead of you know, whatever example.com wants to send us for baz.png. Um, and has a lot of other great properties. IPFS aims to address a number of problems. Um, a couple of those are censorship, so being more resistant to authoritarian control, um, being more resilient to going offline, as I mentioned, being able to collaborate even if um, you are losing a central connection to a server, that's fine. In IPFS, you, you want to be much more resilient to the connections you can make between devices. Um, that also lets you be more efficient. So if there's already um, a copy of data you care about near you, you can use that copy. You don't have to go to some central authority in order to fetch it over and over and over again. This is also good from a security perspective and an emerging network perspective as well, putting less load on, on kind of central um, internet access. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit very quickly about IPFS ecosystem growth. Um, probably a lot of you are already familiar with the exciting things that have been happening in the IPFS ecosystem, but quick refresher for folks. Um, there are tons of applications building in the IPFS ecosystem, um, building businesses from kind of content curation and sharing to social networks to um, kind of data management, identity services, blockchains, DeFi, a ton of amazing applications that are all building in this space and collaborating and sharing data with each other. Um, and this is growing a lot as well. We see many more applications coming in here. I think I've had to extend this down a couple of times from an ecosystem diagram perspective to fit in more applications that are coming. A couple notable highlights from just Q1 in terms of the, the awesome things that have been happening in the IPFS ecosystem. Um, you had Opera adding support, default built-in support for IPFS in their, their Android browser. Um, Brave launched their swag store on IPFS. Wolfram Alpha or Wolfram Language <laughs> has default support for IPFS as an external storage option. Um, we saw a number of websites like the Ethereum website coming to IPFS and hosting themselves here, um, taking, taking advantage of all of the new um, decentralized TLDs. So now we see a proliferation of ETH and crypto and Zill and other decentralized domains. Um, we did a ton of work with, with Netflix over kind of the Q3, Q4 timeframe um, and talked about that as part of the release we did, um, making BitSwap a lot faster and more performant. There's a new Rust IPFS out there that folks can participate in and contribute to um, that's optimizing itself for use in kind of more, um, more constrained devices, IoT cases, things like that. Um, just recently, Textile Hub came on the scene, which is really exciting. Fleek, who you'll also hear from later today, um, and Ceramic as well, are all doing awesome work and launching new projects um, and, and building tools within the IPFS ecosystem that help build, build up all developers and, uh, and give us the capabilities we need to keep innovating and pushing, pushing the ball forward from um, the perspective of projects building on top of IPFS. So as you can see, lots of cool stuff happening just in the past couple of months. One notable improvement, 
as well was the IPFS 0.5 launch, which you'll hear about from Stephen shortly, which ushered in a lot of IPFS performance improvements. Um, it was the largest launch we've done in years to the core Go IPFS implementation um, and, and helped speed up a ton of important areas for the IPFS project. Um, kind of across the gamut from adding new, new content and data to IPFS to providing that data and sending it out, sharing it in the network, um, to finding that data quickly from other nodes that are hosting it, and then fetching that data from them. Every single part of the life cycle of data in IPFS is faster, which is awesome. Um, one, one point in particular, a, a major focus for this was content routing speed, so how quickly you can find the data you want in the network. And we've already seen really serious improvements um, just in the public network, though we only have, I think, you know, something between 12 and 20,000 people have upgraded to the um, to IPFS 0.5. Um, we're still, we're already seeing massive improvements here in terms of the, the content routing speed. I'm sure Stephen will tell us more, more about the, the latest updates soon. Um, in addition to content routing, we also improved transfer speed. This is all of the, the work that we did um, with Netflix in order to benchmark and hone our data transfer algorithms. Um, and so here for our benchmarks around container image distribution, we went from uh, an original three, three seconds down to one second, um, which is awesome and even better in comparison to something like Docker Hub. Um, we're, we're able to really improve on these benchmarks, which is great. So I wanted to talk a little bit um, specifically as it relates to folks in this, in this ecosystem where we're trying to build infrastructure and services and tools to help the entire IPFS network grow and accelerate. Um, for three particularly growing segments we're seeing within IPFS, um, and, and then talk also a little bit about how they relate the, the opportunities that they're opening up for folks from the infrastructure perspective. Um, so the first one of those is the Web3 ecosystem. Um, this is probably very familiar to all of us. We spend a lot of time thinking about um, all of the amazing tools and kind of new capabilities that Web3 is adding to the web today. Um, and we see really strong adoption of IPFS in this vertical. Um, one of those examples is the proliferation of websites built on IPFS um, that's been happening over, you know, it's been happening for a while, but it's really picked up speed in the last four, four months or so. And I really think it's thanks to the tools and capabilities that folks are bringing into the, the ecosystem and making it so easy for someone to very quickly deploy their own website or a decentralized front end for their application um, onto IPFS. It, it, you know, now there are uploaders built into all of these decentralized domain names. Um, Fleek has come and it is doing very seamless, like, um, you know, Net Netlify style GitHub uploading. I, I think the tooling here has precipitated that massive increase. Um, I originally had like screenshots of um, all of almanet.eth um, and the crypto domain listing because there were just so many sites, but it was overwhelming. You couldn't even see. So I just chose a, a subset of, um, of the TLDs that, that represent sites being built on IPFS. Um, but this is a really growing area and a lot of I think there's now thousands and thousands of these websites floating around that people can um, use seamlessly over IPFS, which is great. Um, I mentioned also people who are building front ends for their applications in IPFS in order to be decentralized and then might have a, a decentralized backend, say, built on a smart contract. And that's particularly popular in the DeFi space where you see a lot of um, kind of web wallets or um, kind of other DeFi tools being built where they put the front end for their tooling in IPFS, connect it to a smart contract on a blockchain like Ethereum, and through that, they're able to have a fully decentralized ecosystem, um, and, and the tooling can be accessed from anywhere and self-hosted. And, and that's a, something also that's been accelerating as it's gotten easier to put things on, on IPF, like deploy websites on IPFS, this has grown as well. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of progress and I expect it to continue accelerating over the next couple of months. So clearly Web3 is like a, is the bread and butter for a lot of these tools um, and it's been growing a lot as well. So there's, this is a small subset of all of the, the different applications that are thriving within the Web3 ecosystem and that are using IPFS by default as the way they do content addressable storage. 
Um, to highlight just two that I think are particularly beautiful, um, one is Audius. Um, they're a distributed music platform, um, kind of like a um, SoundCloud uh, alternative, but where every artist is uploading songs to their own IPFS node and have control over their music and, and their relationship with their friends. And um, they have a, a web app, a mobile app. I use this regularly. Um, there's a, an indie artist who has an amazing um, Into the Unknown remix kind of re reshaping of the song. It's beautiful and um, really excited about the kind of level of polish that's coming to uh, applications being built in Web3 ecosystem today, um, where it's it's leaning into what capabilities can we add um, that that really solve problems for a user group. So this one is, you know, making you know supporting musicians in the relationships they want to have with their music and with their fans, um, and making sure that that the Web3 part augments that experience and, and enables that um, while still having the beautiful like user journey that you'd expect from uh, kind of a classic web two site, which is amazing. Um, the other example I'll hi highlight is Fleek. Um, I loved using that in order to put up my own personal website on, um, on IPFS. And, and again, this is adding the critical piece of tooling and simplicity to, to make a, something that was already possible, accessible to a much broader population. And I think this is a really critical insight as you make the tooling and infrastructure easier and easier to use as you simplify that UX flow, um, more, your adoption rate just skyrockets because you, you don't constrain yourself to people who need to understand the technical underpinnings, need to be familiar with, with more technical tools like using the command line. You know, it explodes in terms of people who are excited and see potential use cases for how this, how Web3, how, how the tooling we're building can solve problems. So use of tooling can have massive impact. Um, and I think that's a, an important lesson for all of us building the space. All right, so that's Web3 ecosystem, um, which I think is doing amazing work. I also wanted to talk a little bit about developer tooling, where I think there's growing adoption that we don't quite have the um, kind of diversity and, and kind of strength that, that Web3 does. This is increasing a lot um, and also a huge opportunity for us. Um, I'd class the work we did with, uh, with Netflix on improving BitSwap within this world, where you're trying to distribute container images um, very quickly peer to peer, but you're you're taking IPFS and applying it to a um, kind of a DevOps pipeline, CI, CD. How do we make it faster? How do we make it more efficient? Um, you know, how do we how do we use content addressable storage to solve problems either in a Web two system um, or or by upgrading just the necessary components to to utilize Web three? And and I think this is a a great example of where we can kind of have bridge opportunities. Um, between the Web3 world and Web2 ecosystems where they're, again, trying to fight for efficiency and performance. Um, this, this kind of uh, talks to the opportunities here with DevOps tooling, things like Docker Hub, things with CI, CD. Um, I think there's growing, growing interest and in adoption here, um, thinking of using IPFS for VM distribution, um, other, other kind of workflows in the, um, the operation space. Um, and so a lot of of new nascent projects coming up in this space. Um, one I'll mention is we did we did a chunk of work with um, making IPFS faster and more efficient for package management. And so um, open work starting up with um, getting Mix, which is um, one of the one of the package managers we we talked with a lot, um, working on top of IPFS. So you can have your um, build outputs or even intermediary build steps on IPFS. Um, we also have a project for, for a while called NPM on IPFS, which allows you to more, more resiliently mirror and decentralize where you're fetching your, your NPM files from. Um, and this allowed you, I think we actually brought to IPFS camp a seven terabyte drive of all of the NPM data so that it was there on site and you didn't have to go um, fetch NPM files and repos from some distant place. Someone was already hosting them. So if you used NPM on IPFS, um, it was right there within our local IPFS camp Wi-Fi. Um, we also have pack 
command on top of IPFS. Um, Ruben did this on top of IPFS cluster. So you can now follow the um, Pacman repository here and help a mirror um, very seamlessly just by um, kind of joining his cluster follow. Uh, and so generally this idea of, of taking, decentralizing the people who are mirroring um, package manager registries and doing that in a content addressable way has benefits around deduplication and sending data peer to peer. And so finally, I um, wanted to talk briefly about large data. Um, there's been a ton of groups, you know, kind of uh, one of the aspects of IPFS that people have long been excited about, and there's a number of projects in this space, but I think what we're gonna see over the next, the next couple of months, the next six months or so, is just a massive explosion in this large data space. Um, we already have things like Wikipedia on IPFS, both um, English Wikipedia and Turkish Wikipedia, making sure that um, IPFS is censorship resistant and all of this um, critical knowledge for humanity is accessible um, on, on these sorts of platforms. Um, so a collaborative cluster for Project Gutenberg in Spanish, I believe. Um, so there's a number of these data sets that are already on IPFS and, and many people can participate in helping um, kind of spread and make accessible, but bringing more and more of the critical data that humanity wants to rely on, that we want to be resilient to any sort of fault, and, um, and we want to make sure is, is going to be available 100 years from now so that we can, um, you know, be act building our interstellar uh, society, you know, using all of this knowledge and resources. Um, this is a, a kind of a growing area and then, um, I think something that we'll, we'll see in the next couple months. Um, there's a number of data sets already up on IPFS on the, where you can just browse, browse through these um, and help pin and host them. Um, there's the work that the Filecoin team has done around Starlings, making it really easy for people to do um, decentralized storage and data preservation, and a ton of other opportunities around VR and video and other large data sets, um, a lot of whom are, are thinking in the Filecoin space where like, great, you have huge amounts of data. How do you find a cheap uh, storage alternative um, where you can make, make that data accessible and long-lived? Um, a meta point here, as we look at all these spaces, it definitely feels like we're, we're on an accelerating uh, trajectory or curve. Um, the inflection point happening with the ecosystem where the proliferation of websites, the prolif proliferation of tooling and the professionalization, like the, the extent to which the UX is upgrading around this tooling is really amazing to see. Um, you know, all of these applications, you know, last, last year at this time, like many of these groups weren't on the map for us. And so it's awesome to think forward of all of the new groups um, that will be coming and joining and participating in this ecosystem. Um, just in the past year, we saw a 30x increase in the number of nodes participating in the IPFS network. So now there's hundreds of thousands of nodes who are all you know, collaborating, sharing data, working together to help make the IPFS ecosystem um, so vibrant. Um, and so that, that level of growth, you know, we're, we're making sure that we're ready now for that next 30x from a performance and reliability standpoint um, so that we can keep being on this amazing trajectory. Um, and, and we're seeing some signs that, that those things are continuing. So uh, for example, we run one of many IPFS gateways um, on the core team, and we've seen about a four to five X increase um, in the number of requests we're seeing per day. So now it's about 13 million requests today, um, accessing about five terabytes of data. And so we're, we're definitely continuing to see increased adoption and utilization of the tools and resources within the IPFS ecosystem. It's generally hard to get a, a read on these large decentralized networks and how they're growing and improving. Um, so we, we use the signals we can. All right, so thinking a little bit about the, the ecosystem of infra tools within IPFS. Um, I'll highlight two in particular, which I think are really well represented here in the people who are gonna be talking later today. Just as a quick overview for folks who are, are new or um, kind of nascent in this space. So one is pinning services. Um, and these are our, our, our applications or services where uh, a user, say, um, wants to pin some data, wants data to continue to be accessible in the IPFS network, even when their own personal node goes offline. Um, and so uh, a lot of examples here are like, you know, I have my own local node running on my laptop, but even when my laptop goes offline, 
or I go, I move somewhere else. I want to make sure this data is accessible and maybe accessible in multiple different locations, um, maybe having resilient copies. So, um, replicated in a lot of different areas. Um, and I want it to be edge cached. I want it to be close to the people who are trying to download it and access it. And so there's a number of, of groups within the, the IPFS ecosystem, all of whom are providing this sort of service, this persistence service to nodes in the IPFS network who want to be more ephemeral, but want the data that they care about, their photo collection, their uh, application data, their um, you know, other, other important metadata about uh, their node, want that to continue being accessible. Um, so that's one major class. Another example is, is gateways, HTTP gateways. Um, so thriving network of PFS nodes that are interoperating with each other, but still a number of, of folks who are accessing um, the, the data in the IPFS network are coming through normal web browsers that are using HTTP. Um, and so this makes sure that, that that bridge is well accounted for and it's, and it's you have a you know, fast, reliable, uh, highly accessible, access from HTTP into IPFS content. And so many, many Web3 applications rely on HTTP gateways um, in order to make, make their data accessible. So if you're not bundling a local node within either a, web, a website or a tool that you're relying upon, say, you know, maybe you're on a mobile device and you're, you're being very constrained about the resources you're using. Um, if you're not embedding a local node, then you're using something like an HTTP gateway in order to bring the data from the IPFS network to these endpoints in the ecosystem. Um, and there's a ton of people who are offering HTTP gateways, as I was mentioning. Um, there's Cloudflare, Infura, a ton of others. Um, you can go to this public gateway checker to see all of the, the various gateways that exist. Um, but, but this is kind of also a growing place where, um, you know, if if you're storing data in the IPFS network, you also want to make sure it's highly accessible um, and not just to people who are already running IPFS nodes, but to the, the wider world as we continue on this upgrade path and trajectory. So this implies um, some opportunities. Looking at the areas in the, that IPFS adoption in the ecosystem is growing, thinking about the sort of tools that people are already finding niches for in the IPFS ecosystem today, um, there's opportunities going forward for IPFS infra to, to provide more. Um, so looking at these opportunities for Web3 in particular, this is um, things like pinning services, so pinning application data, uh, making sure that that stays around. As an app devel developer, you maybe don't want to run all of your own node infrastructure, and so utilizing a service that helps back up all of your app data or that even works directly with your users from an application perspective so that they're backing up their own app data with a service provider. Um, that's a, a major area of opportunity. HTTP gateways are also very common. There's a number of, um, you know, many of, of the Web3 tools use this in some way or another when you have users who don't have an embedded IPFS node to make it more accessible. Um, we're also seeing more kind of network infrastructure come online that massively unlocks adoption and growth. Um, an example I'll call out here is ETHDNS, which is a project we did with the Ethereum name service. Um, and, and what this does is it, this is the part where you can take like ethereum.eth and add dot link to the end of it. And then even if you aren't running MetaMask or IPFS companion or a local node or anything like that, you're now able to look up that decentralized TLD. And, and those small pieces of infrastructure make, um, make these services and make Web3 in general just much more easy for um, people to adopt and come over from Web2, you know, gateway, um, I guess like literally is a gateway, but um, pulling people from kind of one, one ecosystem to the next, making it a very easy on-ramp and growth um, so they can start understanding the value that's, that's possible for them here. Um, there's also things like developer tooling, SDKs, um, just easier interfaces or alternative interfaces to make it really easy to use IPFS. Looking in the developer tooling space, um, definitely tooling around CI CD pipelines or other aspects of developer tooling that, that can be augmented by, um, by peer to peer tools or by content addressing. Um, the, the difference here is being able to truly demonstrate that the performance is better. So this is testing tooling and, and benchmarks and validation, but then also kind of the seamless way that it would fit into an enterprise um, use case, the management layer, 
um, you know, all of the, the di diagnostics, telemetry, um, other infrastructure that you would actually need to do this to, to deploy IPFS into, say, a local cloud or um, an enterprise pipeline or something like that. Um, I think there are huge opportunities here that are mostly under um, undertaken advantage of. So lots of opportunity for folks to, to build in this space um, and maybe we'll get the next, you know, uh, alternative to Docker built on top of IPFS. Um, and then finally, large data. Um, there's a, a couple of, of things in this space that make this more accessible, things like IPFS cluster, which does um, replication across many different nodes. Um, you can imagine more tools around erasure coding, around caching and route, routing services, so that when you have very, very large data sets, think Internet Archive scale of, of data, um, that you can quickly upload data sets like that to IPFS, um, that you can uh, cache the most important or, or the, the hot parts of, of that data so they're highly available. Um, you can even do like more intelligent routing strategies over top of these large data sets. Um, and then the sort of tooling and dashboards around managing data sets like this for large organizations and institutions. Um, I think this is also a huge opportunity. Like um, when you think about groups who have a lot of this large data, they, they need the tooling that helps them bring it to the people within Web3 who want to take advantage of it. Um, and so this is, I think also a big opportunity from an infra perspective. And thank you so much. Really excited for today. It's going to be an awesome, awesome time. And um, over to Steven to share some of the notable improvements in IPFS 0.5.